Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So how many of you have heard this phrase lately, something about draining the swamp? You know, people chuckled at each service. Maybe they're just wondering where this could possibly, possibly be going. Well, our current sitting president, as part of his uh, campaign trail, and I don't know if he coined it or not, but he certainly popularized it, this idea, this promise... That if you elected him, if you followed after him, if you just gave him a shot at being the leader of this country, he would drain the swamp. Now, I don't normally have an extremely high or lofty view of government, admittedly, but neither have I ever quite pictured our government as a form of swamp. The picture is pretty difficult. Swamps are kind of oppressive. They're often stagnant. They are a home to unpleasant denizens like snakes and gators and all kinds of unpleasant bugs. This is his description, and as I understand his point, basically, the president was claiming that Washington was full of people full of bureaucracy, full of problems that mirror a swamp. And if only you followed his way, he could drain it. He promised he would drain it. Now, it's interesting for me because when I think of draining the swamp, the thing that comes to my mind is actually what we're celebrating today, which is the ascension of our Lord. But before I can explain the mystery of why draining the swamp and the ascension of our Lord actually come so perfectly together, I want to make a little bit of a preamble about the ascension itself. And the first thing we have to get a hold of when we're talking about the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ into heaven, we are talking about a historical fact. We are talking about a historical fact that is founded and precipitated by a literal and historical resurrection. Acts chapter 1 verse 3 says, He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus is alive and well as he goes into heaven, which is completely the opposite of what we would normally think. The people in our minds who go to heavens, who go, to the, uh, go into heaven, are dead. That's where the spirits go. You go to heaven, hopefully, because you want to be there, because Jesus Christ has brought you there. But of course, the reality is you have to die to get there. That is the normal pattern of all mankind. In order that, to enter into heaven, you must die first. But not so with this man who, even though he has died, is actually still alive. He's not being carried off to heaven as one of us might be after our death to await the coming resurrection. Jesus Christ is stepping into the heavens as a triumphant king. He is going as one who is ready to claim his rightful throne. Now, the second thing that we got to get a hold of when we're talking about the ascension is that this was witnessed by the apostles. Acts chapter 1, 9 says, And when he had said these things, that's Jesus, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. The apostles witnessed this, and even though often in our theology we talk a lot about the cross, And we talk a little bit less, but still a good amount about the resurrection. The ascension of our Lord often does not get a lot of play. But as it turns out, if we pay attention to the way that the apostles speak, the way that the New Testament talks, the ascension of our Lord is central to the communication of the gospel. It was a major part of their witness. And if you don't believe that, then I urge you to consider that first Christian martyr, Stephen. Now, Stephen died, as a matter of fact, because of his witness to the ascended Christ. 
He gives the Jews who he's speaking to this long speech about how how up to the present day they had rebelled against God and they had been stiff-necked and they had missed the boat. Somehow the Christ had come into their midst and rather than embracing him, they had killed the Lord of life. They had murdered the very source of hope in this world. And as if that accusation isn't enough, he eventually says to them what we have recorded in Acts 7, 55 through 56. But he, that is Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God. And Jesus was standing at the right hand of God and he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. There was a lot of things the Jews of that day could tolerate from these Christians. They could live with the idea that they thought Jesus was the Messiah. They could perhaps accept that they believed he had risen from the dead. But how dare you say that man is at the right hand of God? Who do you think you are to say that that Jesus is actually ruling and reigning in power, alive and well at the right hand of God? That kind of blasphemy in their minds only has one appropriate response. And if you remember the very next words of the story, it talks about how they gnashed their teeth at him. And they put their fingers in their ears and they picked up stones and they killed, murdered Stephen. All because he had the audacity to proclaim this part of our theology we often don't talk about, which is the ascended, ruling, and reigning Jesus Christ. I bring all this up to say that this is critically important. The apostles witnessed it, and men and women in the early church were willing to die for it. Now I want to resume this original thought that we were getting at of, What is the connection between draining the swamp and the ascension of our Lord? And to get at that idea, we have to take a look with open eyes at the state of our world and the heavens, especially as the scriptures describe them. This is how Paul describes our modus operandi, how we are going about our lives in Ephesians 6, 12. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I think what's astonishing to realize here is that if we take the words of the scripture seriously, we have to reevaluate some of our pristine, wonderful view of what the heavenlies really look like. In reality, the heavenly places are clogged, they are full, they are stuffed to the brim with false, evil, demonic, oppressive powers. To put it in the words of our president... uh, This world and the heavenlies are a swamp. This world, all that we know, and even the heavenlies are a swamp. To put it more plainly, this is a world that is governed by demonic, supernatural, unseen darkness. It is a world that is constantly under attack, besieged by the powers of evil, by the powers in the kingdom of Satan, by principalities and powers that were alive before you and will outlive you. They will live to continue to attempt to oppress your children and your grandchildren. This is the state of our world and the heavens. If you don't believe me, if it's tough to swallow, then I ask you to consider this. How often when we're talking about something like our children, do we count it a victory if they simply have a job? Or if our child can maintain some kind of a normal relationship? Or if they're just a semi-productive member of society? 
I cannot tell you how many times Christian parents have come up to me and said, well, my son's living with his girlfriend and they don't go to church, but he's holding a job down and he has a normal relationship, so I'm pretty happy. The bar is so absurdly low that even the most basic fundamental elements of our lives, when they exist in us, in our family members, in our friends, we're excited. We're thrilled. We're even willing to brag about it. The sad reality is all that that proves is that in so many cases, you cannot even get that much level of normal. In most cases, there is so much dysfunction and abnormality, what we would consider normal is in fact the unusual thing. It's rare to see people flourish and well in any meaningful way. I want to ask you a series of questions that I'm going to ask you to just keep holding your hand up for each one that you answer as true. And I'm going to hold my hand up because all of them are true for me personally. How many of you know someone who has committed suicide? How many of you know someone who has cancer? How many of you have a friend or family member who is struggling with drugs or alcohol? I want you to take a quick look around at all the hands. You can put them down now. My brothers and sisters, all of us are not six degrees away, but we are extremely close to seeing the effect of this oppressive state of our world and the state of the heavenlies. There's this old lie that Satan has been telling us from the beginning, and it goes like this. He's been saying, humans, this is all your fault, and the only way to get out is for you to fix it. You know, the truth of the matter is we are at fault, but we have no ability to get out of it ourselves. And the reality is much more complex. In fact, we are being manipulated We are being oppressed. It is being done at levels far beyond our comprehension and insidious ways that would blow our minds. The regime of Satan has been working at keeping us down and in darkness and away from the light of God since the very beginning, and he has become very, very good at it. Once again, all of this to say is that We're living in that swamp. And the heavenly realms are infested with that swamp. But my friends, this is what makes the ascension, this part of our theology that so often receives little attention, such fantastically good news for us. And this is why Jesus Christ has triumphed over all the evil forces in the heavenly realms. Jesus Christ is the guy who has gone to the highest place and has said to each and every one of you, I will drain this swamp. I will fix this. I will clean this place up. I will get rid of the people and the difficulties and the problems that stand in the way. He will go to battle with forces and powers far beyond our ability to handle. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 21 puts it this way. Jesus has been seated far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. And every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. You see, our Lord didn't just go to Washington. Washington's a big place. And it's an important place. But Jesus Christ has ascended to be at the highest of all places. To be above all human government, all human powers, all angelic authority. To stay at the right hand of God. And he is now, even up to this day, each and every single day, draining the swamp. 
little by little, our God, our man, Jesus Christ, our representative, is draining away all of the things in this swamp. He is draining away the swamp such that one day the promise will be that eventually there will be no swamp no more. There will be no more times when people say, I know someone who's committed suicide. No one will even know about cancer anymore. No one will know of drugs or alcohol. No one will know of the crushing, crushing force of sin. Jesus Christ has promised us a day that not only is he in the act of draining it now, but it will be drained forever. It will never change again. But at the moment, as we wait for him to complete his work, Ephesians also reassures us that Christ is at the top of everything governing the church right now. He's not far away. He's not distant. He hasn't turned his back on us or left us as orphans. But as you'll hear very soon when we talk about Pentecost next week, Jesus Christ is continuing his work with us through his Holy Spirit. He is leading the way for us so that we can walk on dry ground through the swamp and enter into eternal life with him. He's preparing that place for us to be with him forever. My brothers and sisters, because Jesus Christ is ascended, he reigns. And because he reigns, the swamp of this world and even the swamp in the heavenly places is being drained. And because it is being drained, there is life and hope for all in his name. In Jesus' name. Amen.